Next up, we have James Erbib, a founder of uh, Rethink X. James Erbib is a London based investor in technology. He is the founder of Telus Matter, uh, an independent philanthropic foundation uh, dedicated to exploring the impacts of disruptive technology and its potential for solving some of the world's most challenging problems. Uh, in addition, Jamie oversees a London-based uh, family office with a diversified portfolio across all asset classes and a focus on the risks and opportunities of technology uh, disruption. A graduate in history from Trinity College, Cambridge, he has a master's in sustainability leadership also from Cambridge, uh, and he is a qualified chartered accountant and worked as an investment analyst covering utilities. James Erbib, you're very welcome this morning, and we look forward to hearing about you, or sorry, hearing from you about rethinking humanity. Thank you to Gerard for inviting me here today. Now we've got a lot to get through, so I'm just going to dive straight in. Humanity is at a crossroads. Technological progress is opening up extraordinary possibilities for mankind, but also creating catastrophic risks. The speed and scale of change over the next decade will be unprecedented, but we're blind to what's coming. If we're successfully to navigate the 2020s, we'll need to learn to think differently. Our work at Rethink X is really about understanding the patterns and processes that drive this change. Our framework can help us to understand what really drives events, both through history and today, in a way that conventional models cannot. These models are concerned only with the surface, the data, that are the outcome of these processes. And so conventional forecasts look forward by extrapolating current trends in that data. We take a different approach and look under the bonnet, fo focusing on understanding the complex interactions and forces that drive that data. So we're going to start by looking at our framework before we go back into history and see how these same processes have driven the events of history at all levels of society. We hope it will leave you with a different viewpoint on where we are today and where we might go. So now let's go back a hundred or so years in history to when the first cars appeared on our streets. So first the question, how many gas stations were there in the US in 1905? The answer, zero, not a single one. And yet, in just 20 years from that date, the car had rendered the horse obsolete as a form of transportation, going from less than 5% of the market to 95% by 1925. So how did this happen? Well, I want to walk you through our framework to explain. So back in 1905, there were huge barriers to adoption beyond just a lack of gas stations acting to constrain change. Cars in 1905 were expensive. They weren't very good. They were often extremely unreliable. They often were just carriages with an engine strapped on. Consumers were skeptical of these new vehicles. They were accustomed to traveling in carriages and even loved their horses. The carriage market was entrenched. It was locked in with mature supply chains, manufacturing capacity, and economies of scale. On the other hand, cars had almost nothing they needed. The supply chain relied on bicycle parts or parts knocked together by blacksmiths. The oil industry was in its infancy with little refining capacity. There were a few paved roads, and as we've seen, no gas stations. There was also no service industry, no mechanics at all. If you wanted your car repaired back then, you took it to the blacksmith. And of course, barely anyone knew how to drive. But these seemingly insurmountable barriers turned out to be variables, not constants, little more than speed bumps in the road to the disruption. And that's why it makes me laugh today when people cite a lack of charge points, for instance, as a barrier to the adoption of electric vehicles. So the car had only become possible a few years before this period, the result of a convergence of technologies. For a viable car to be produced, it required the development of rubber vulcanization, the invention of the pneumatic tire, 
The Bessemer process, which caused the cost of steel production to drop by 10x over the second half of the 19th century. And of course, the invention of the internal combustion engine. This convergence is a start point of disruption. Convergence creates divergence. That is to say, new possibilities. For the products and services that can be produced, for the business model to deliver the value of these products, and for the economy and society more broadly. As early cars hit the market, we see their cost and capabilities improve rapidly. This improvement in cost and capability is the primary driver of disruption and opens more market opportunities. The first car sold in the US cost $250 per horsepower, but by 1916, that price had dropped over 10x to just $17. As people began to buy cars in increasing numbers, accelerators of change kicked in, driving the S-curve of car adoption and the collapse of a carriage industry. Smart and entrepreneurial people and investment were attracted to the industry, driving a cycle of rapid improvement in cost and capabilities. And as cost and capabilities improved, more demand was created, driving economies of scale and investment in supply chains. The development of the moving, the moving assembly line and vast increases in capacity drove costs lower. Public opinion was transformed. Consumer skepticism was replaced by desire. Together, these accelerating forces drove a virtuous cycle of improving costs and capabilities and decreasing demand. The carriage industry, on the other hand, went the other way, entering a vicious cycle of decreasing demand, reversing economies of scale, and increasing prices. A lack of investment meaning that carriages ceased to improve. Carriages began to be perceived as old-fashioned, and bankruptcy quickly followed for the manufacturers and their supply chains. The leading players were unable to adapt, hamstrung by incumbent mindsets, incentives, and interests that saw them rapidly outcompeted. Within 20 years, it was essentially over. A new transport system quickly became embedded itself representing a new incumbency. And indeed, despite huge improvements in technology and in the geographic spread of this system, Henry Ford would still recognize the structure of the transportation system today. The system itself has been stable for over a hundred years. And it was not just a one-for-one -one substitution, a car for a carriage, as people often think disruptions are about. This patent application Takes, one, takes this one-for-one one substitution idea even more literally. Disruptions often appear this way at the start. An electric vehicle for a gasoline car, a novel protein burger for a cow burger, or a solar farm for a coal-powered power plant. But in fact, everything in the system can change. The possibilities, the technology, the business model, the value chain and infrastructure, it represents what we call a phase change, a change in system state. And the effects of this disruption rippled out across the economy and society, far beyond the industry itself. It affected the materials used in transport. Wood, iron and oats were replaced by steel, oil and rubber. Other sectors were impacted. Finance as the consumer loan industry was built around the car. Retail was transformed as shopping malls and supermarkets became possible. Agriculture likewise was transformed as equipment was mechanized and the speed of transport meant that new expanses of land could be brought into cultivation. It changed the layout of our towns and cities, impacting where we lived and worked and where we built our schools and hospitals and factories. Jobs and prosperity were created by the leaders. Indeed, by the 1950s, one in every seven jobs was related to the car industry in the US, and the car underpinned America's rise to global prominence. Global geopolitics was transformed, as 20th century geopolitics was dominated by oil. Urban health improved as the problems of, the, of horse dung and carcasses were cleared from the streets, and one set of environmental problems was replaced by another, the effects of which only became apparent decades later. 
and even those poor, obsolete horses were put to another use. So this process of change is what we see in all complex systems. It is non-linear. It's driven by the balance of brakes and accelerators in the system that delivers this pattern of change. Long periods of incremental change or stasis when the system is in equilibrium, punctuated by periods of rapid, non-linear change as the system flips into a new state, driven by new rules. It's a pattern we see in the human body, in ecosystems, in markets, and even in evolution. In human systems, this change tends to come from the edge. The incumbent leaders of the old system, whether businesses or countries, are unable to adapt, hamstrung by incumbent mindsets, interests, and incentives. Now, whilst the car had a profound impact on society, it happened within the context of a stable organizing system. That is, the models of thought, the economic, social, and political systems, the governance structures and institutions that understand, manage, and govern society. Throughout history, civilizations have developed technology to solve problems. Technology improves our ability to manipulate matter, energy, information, the foundations of our physical world. But technology alone is not enough for societies to progress. They need to develop ways to better understand the world, belief systems that are conducive to progress and to social stability, and the organizational capabilities to realize the potential of technology. Thus, organizing systems and production systems co-evolve. Now, occasionally, technological disruptions have impacted even the organizing system. Now, I want to go back further in history and look at the role of the printed book that in a chain of complex causality helped to catalyze the emergence of our modern world. But first, a bit of context. The collapse of Rome had plunged Europe into a dark age, lasting nearly a thousand years. By the 13th century, Europe began to emerge from the darkness. Trade routes to the east redeveloped. A thirst for secular knowledge manifested itself in exploding demand for manuscripts, shown here in this graph, and the foundation of universities. The religious dogma that had acted to constrain progress began to unwind. The balance of power began to shift as the Black Death caused labor costs to increase. An increasing trade meant that wealth accumulated in the hands of merchants and bankers. High labor costs and low capital costs, driven by efficient institutions, meant that labor-saving devices were at a premium. It was into this context that Gutenberg launched his invention. The printed book was a result of a technological convergence, the introduction of paper to replace parchment, new inks, an adaptive olive press, and metal movable type. Costs plunged dramatically, and rapidly the book replaced the man manuscript. Affordable books led to an explosion in demand and increasing literacy rates, which provided a key underpinning of industrialization to follow, and also created more demand for books. The effects of this disruption cascaded across society, accelerating the Renaissance and enabling the Reformation and Enlightenment, and eventually the scientific revolution. The reductionism reflected in the new scientific method manifested in a growing belief in individual rights. The rights of individuals underpinned a new political system, democracy, which replaced monarchy. In free market capitalism, which replaced feudalism, and in a new social contract as individuals won control of their own labor. As horizons expanded and the world became accessible, a need for scale saw states and cities coalesce into nation states, which became the predominant governance structure. The printed book represented an information sector disruption, the first wave of disruption in the emergence of an industrialized civilization. Further waves of disruption followed, transforming societies and raising the ceiling on what civilization could achieve. The baggage of incumbency saw Southern Europe weighed down by religious dogma, 
entrenched interests and an obsolete organising system, allowing the UK and Northern Europe to take the lead. They themselves were then overtaken by the US. This system has now spread around the world. This pattern of breakthrough, of extraordinary improvements in the capabilities of, of a society, has been repeated a handful of times in history. So let's go back to the dawn of Homo sapiens and look at the history of humanity in five minutes. So early humans evolved in a period of extreme climate volatility. Survival was a key evolutionary driver. Selection for the ability to problem solve saw human brains grow dramatically over the past million years. Now, for most of this period, humans could do little more than keep themselves alive. But as the climate stabilized 10,000 years ago, in a handful of places, humans developed settlements and agriculture. They found themselves in a new paradigm, a new system of production based on the extraction and exploitation of scarce resources, including people. This world of zero-sum competition drove a growth imperative. Societies needed to exploit or be exploited, dominate or be dominated. Those societies that developed the best technological and organizational capabilities spread through conquest or imitation. In this extraction-based system, economic outcomes like growth are in conflict with environmental and social outcomes. Those societies that slowed down progress and tried to live sustainably or equitably were outcompeted that those, that those that prioritized growth and progress. So this growth, growth imperative was the key driver of evolution for civilizations. The exploitation of people and planet was thus hardwired into this system. And this is the context for the cycle of civilizations. So when we look at the societal capabilities of civilizations throughout history, we see the same pattern of change. Long periods of incremental progress interspersed with rapid change. Here we use maximum city size as a proxy for capabilities, both technological and organizational. And we can see this pattern clearly. But beneath this line, which, is, which represents the high watermark of city size, the picture is far more complex. It's a pattern of breakthrough and collapse, two steps forward and one step back. Here, for instance, is Rome. After becoming the first civilization to support a city of one million inhabitants, it quickly collapsed, and by 700 AD was down to just 50,000 people. Successive societies, Baghdad and then various Chinese cities, hit the same ceiling and themselves collapsed and a million people remained the limit until London broke through in the early 1800s. The breakthrough cycle was driven by 10x improvements in technological capabilities and combined with improvements in organizational capabilities. The societies that broke through previous ceilings were typically on the edge of prior civilizations, unencumbered by the baggage of incumbent thought, incentives, and interests that happened to chance on the winning combination of technology and organizing system, and, and of course were favored by geography. As their capabilities grew rapidly, they spread quickly and subsumed those that came within their reach. Over time, they expand to reach their geographic limits, unable to spread further, and they breach their environmental limits, degrading their soils through over-farming, irrigation, deforestation, etc. And as they reach their maximum capacity, the buffers in the system diminish, leaving them increasingly fragile and vulnerable to the impact of shocks and civil unrest, pandemics, drought, famine, and invasion, the horsemen of the apocalypse. The adaptability that allowed them to break through in the first place arose as the elements of the organizing system come to be seen as fundamental truths, constants, not the man-made variables they really are. As fragility and instability grew, an entrenched incumbency would often focus on protecting their own interests by patching up the existing system rather than adapting, focusing on an outdated solution set. 
Thus we see more priests, more blood sacrifice, or more centralization as the civilization enters the death spiral towards collapse. So why is this relevant? Well, let's put it all together and try to understand where we are today. For the first time in history, the context is set for both breakthrough and collapse. The organizing system of the industrial order has been stable since at least 1800 and has changed little. Within this system, we've seen extraordinary improvements in our technological capabilities and in the geographic reach of the system. We are now at a crossroads. Either we'll harness the opportunities appearing and break through the limitations of our industrial extraction-based system, or we'll collapse into a new dark age. Our industrial order has been pushed out of equilibrium, but which way we go is still uncertain. Either way, our current system will be displaced. The actions we take over the 2020s will decide the course. So we've reached the limits of our geographic spread. The industrial order now spans the globe. We're breaching our environmental limits. Inequality is rising. Financial instability is growing, manifesting itself in increasing debt and currency debasement. The buffers in our system, environmental, economic and social, are diminishing, leading to increasing fragility and instability, and leaving us increasingly exposed to the impacts of shocks. The sign of approaching collapse are apparent across society in the failure of our decision-making processes as polarization drives paralysis in our climate system as we degrade our oceans, forests, soils and atmosphere, threatening to trigger the accelerating forces that will tip us out of our current equilibrium. In our economy, as we respond to shocks by pumping in money to prop up the system, debasing our currencies, increasing debt and inequality, all to protect the interests of incumbents, whilst those at the bottom pay the price in job losses and wage stagnation. We focus all our efforts on patching up the existing system, unable to see the potential that's emerging. We're poised to enter the cycle of collapse. But at the same time, extraordinary technological improvements offer the possibility of breakthrough. The industries that built the industrial order, centralized electric power, oil, industrial agriculture and so on, are on the cusp of collapse, about to be outcompeted by cheaper and better alternatives. A cascading process of disruption, led first by information technologies, have already transformed our ability to process and communicate information, and will be followed by energy, transportation, food and materials. Distributed wind, solar, and batteries entirely replacing centralized fossil fuel based generation. Fleets of self driving robo taxis replacing the ownership model of gasoline driven automobiles. And precision biology giving us the ability to build food and materials from the ground up, from the molecule or the cell. We've covered these disruptions in detail in our sector reports that you're welcome to access on our website. Unfortunately, we don't have time today to go through the detail. Now, in a self-reinforcing process of disruption in one sector, it drives exponential improvements in the underlying technologies and creates new possibilities in other sectors. This cascading process of disruption will impact every aspect of society and offer the potential to solve our most intractable problems, climate change, inequality, poverty, and conflict. But this new system of production in these sectors represents an entirely new paradigm. No longer is it based on the extraction and exploitation of scarce resources. A breakdown model where we harness the resources we need from around the world and process it into the things that we want. With huge waste and inefficiency, it's being replaced by a model based on creation, where we build up what we need from the building box electrons, photons, molecules, DNA, and so on, which are available in abundance everywhere. Our centralized hierarchical structures, which are built on economies of scale, will be replaced by distributed, networked, self-sufficient communities. 
our industrial age organizing system, which co-evolved with and was optimized for this extraction-based system. It allowed us to mirror its attributes in our organizing system and to control it from the center. But the emerging system of production is entirely different and will, and will require new models of thought to understand it, new political, social, and economic systems to manage it, and new governance structures and institutions to govern it. We can already see in the information system the problems that are presented by our attempts, by our attempts to control the flow of information through our industrial organizing system. How does a nation state regulate Google or Facebook? Individuals in a basement in Russia are now empowered to influence the democratic process in the most powerful country in the world. Nation states have lost control of the flow of information, just as the church and monarchy did when the printed book arrived. And this is just a start. As every sector of the economy is disrupted, the incompatibility of our organizing system will accelerate its own collapse. The challenge then is to enable a new and better adapted system to emerge. Unfortunately, we're hamstrung by our inability to understand what is happening. Our linear mindsets fail to understand the complexity of the world and the processes of change. The models of thought and belief systems developed through the scientific revolution and enlightenment were, of a, were a huge step forward and benefited us greatly in the industrial era. We broke down the complexity of the world into manageable parts. We're now able to understand the functioning of these individual parts down to the subatomic scale, but we've lost sight of the connections and interactions between the pieces. We separated the parts of the system into silos and we ignore the connections. We look only at simple cause and effect and, ign and ignore the cascading consequences of change. This linear causality, where we assume that a change to variable A causes B to change, but all else remains equal, is a fundamental flaw made by decision makers across society. It leads us to see variables as constants. This linear mindset also causes us to extrapolate current conditions and trends into the future. When we forecast the future, we tend to look backwards and to draw a line to today and then extrapolate it into the future. Now that's fine if you're here in the process. It's not a bad approximation for the future. But as disruption approaches, it's wholly inadequate. These failures manifest in all sorts of ways. When we think at the sector level of the economy, we tend to think inside the box of the existing system. We assume, for instance, that the transport system, the ownership model, the infrastructure, the value chain and so on, which has been stable for over a hundred years, is a constant and will continue indefinitely. So we assume that disruption is about simple substitution. That's why we're seeing incumbent car manufacturers today rushing to get electric vehicles into the market not realizing that by the time they release them, the whole ownership model will have been disrupted itself. Everything will have changed. We won't care about the cost of a vehicle, just the cost of a mile of travel. And that might be free, meaning the value has to be created somewhere else entirely. These failures cause us to assume that barriers to new products are insurmountable, that we'll never ride in an, in an autonomous vehicle or eat a cell-based steak, or that a lack of charge points will constrain electric vehicles, or that the intermittency of renewable energy is a problem, and so on. It leads us to think that disruption will be slow and linear, so businesses and others think that they have time to focus on patching up and improving the old. But it's never slow and linear. It's fast and non-linear, and the impacts cascade. It's why we stumble into disruptions and clean up the mess afterwards, the job losses, the destruction of capital and businesses. It's why we're blind to what's coming over the next decade. And at a civilization level as well, we think inside the box of our current organizing system, assuming its various elements are fundamental truths, they're constants rather than the temporary human constructs they really are. 
Like the Romans or Sumerians, we try to solve our problems by patching up the old system. We think that clean diesel or carbon capture and storage or behaviour change can help us solve climate change. Or that more distribution to solve inequality on one side of the debate or trickle-down economics on the other. All the time we're desperately propping up the economy to preserve jobs and wealth through more debt and taxes, borrowing from the future to pay for today. Our decision-making processes are grinding to a halt as polarisation grows and we argue about the best way to solve our problems. All sides of the political divide, divide trying to solve yesterday's problems with sticking plaster solutions. Just as we desperately need adaptability, our ability to adapt is diminishing. Inside our box, we fail to see that climate change, inequality and conflict are intractable only in an extraction-based system. We don't realise that if we could enable the new creation-based system to emerge, these problems would melt away like the cutting of the Gordian knot. And we'd be faced with a whole different set of issues that we're entirely unaware of. So what do we do? Our current system can't continue. It will either collapse or it will be outcompeted by a better adapted system. To break through, we need to rethink. We need to develop the models of thought to understand this new system. An understanding of complexity and systems and networks applied to every aspect of society. Think of it as a complexity of biology added to the reductionism of physics. We must enable the new system. We must accelerate the rollout of the new transport, energy, food and information systems. We need to create the conditions for the new organising system to emerge. To do this, we must fight incumbency at every level, including in our own mindsets. We must decentralise and we must experiment. We mustn't be afraid of being wrong. The new system will only emerge, if it does at all, from the edge, through trial and painful error. We won't sit in a room and plan this system. The baggage of incumbency means that it's highly unlikely that the leaders today, the US, China or Europe, will lead tomorrow. And we need to bridge to this new system. The sticking plaster solutions have a role in patching up our existing system to build resilience and help it survive long enough to be displaced. But we must not mistake these sticking plasters for the cure. The good news is that our problems are tractable, that we have the potential to create an extraordinary civilization, unlike anything that has come before. But getting there will not be easy. The challenge is to accelerate breakthrough of the new system and to build resilience to push out claps of the old. I want to just leave you now with a couple of quotes to reflect on. Thank you.